Welcome to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Designed for everyone interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Covering food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Nathan Liu. With an education in agriculture, fish and wildlife conservation, and over 15 years of cultivation experience, Nathan is passionate about agroecology and agroforestry. He's co-founder and executive director of Mongol Tribe, a 501c3 with pillars in cooperative development, regenerative practices, and education. As part of its food and medicine sovereignty program, Mongol Tribe is cultivating urban food forests and seed libraries and is developing an edible forest that will host an edible urban forest that will host an apprenticeship program with an emphasis on traditional ecological knowledge and regenerative agriculture practices. Most recently, as part of Mongol Tribe's Natural Land Management Program, Nathan performed a vegetative survey for forest health on Palomar Mountain, which focused primarily on oak trees and ethnobotanicals. Nathan, it's really wonderful to have you here with us. Welcome, welcome. So you you we had a pre-discussion, pre-conversation, and you're really passionate about food sovereignty. And I'm wondering if you could maybe give us a little background on Mongol tribe, how you established that, what what the significance is of the name, and um, then maybe segue into what brought you to this passion about agroforestry and food sovereignty, et cetera. Sure, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here and uh, share with you. And uh, yeah, so Mongol tribe uh, started as uh, an idea of how to cultivate collective community support around ecology and sharing of knowledge and cultural traditions and practices. And so um, I started having uh, gatherings centered around natural time, around full moon and new moon and equinoxes and solstices, just to connect with seasonality and that rhythm of time again. And through that process, I started to uh, support community gardens and just really see kind of where there's an opportunity in our community to come together around health and wellness and music and arts and uh, that connection with the open spaces and, and natural spaces that are in our, in our communities. So um, I had an opportunity to uh, teach a program at the National City Public Library. And through that process, I was encouraged to start the nonprofit as a mechanism for being able to uh, expand the processes that have already was in, uh, starting to develop and share. And um, through that whole exchange, I you know, became an entrepreneur of sorts and started learning about the, the challenges and opportunities of, of having a nonprofit, working with grants and foundations and all those kind of things. Um, but yeah, basically I, I had some support from other colleagues in the industry that were very encouraging for me to just take that step and organize and um, go through that process of, of filing the 501c3 paperwork. And, and from there, it's just been, you know, I can take that business hat off and really focus on my like, scientist and more naturalist kind of roles and just really be involved in now kind of program development and project design. And so, um, so yeah, that was kind of where my passion started to develop around uh, food sovereignty when uh, I was in my agriculture program at uh, Yuba College. And that's near UC Davis area in, in Northern California. And, I just uh, want to interrupt for a second because people might can might be thinking you're in a rural area. You're actually in San Diego. Yeah, so I'm born and raised in San Diego. Yeah, so I grew up in the eastern suburbs of San Diego. You know, twenty minutes, thirty minutes, thirty minutes from the beach, and uh, you know, fishing and bodyboarding and just a very live, active lifestyle. 
And um, San Diego, I love that it's so accessible in its natural spaces. And I really am grateful because uh, throughout my whole lifetime, they've been actually doing restoration work around the lagoonal systems and really making sure that developers aren't creating this, uh, you know, uh, overgrowth of our community open spaces. So, you know, San Diego is uh, one of the most beautiful things is that it's got actually the most organic farms per county, the most farms per county, and it's the highest uh, production per acre agriculture in the country. And there's over 6,000 farms in San Diego, and most of them are less than 10 acres. So it's specialty crops, over 300 different agricultural commodities, and uh, wow. a lot of nursery stock, you know, given the mellow climate that we have, there's a whole diversity of things that can grow here. Um, but one of my favorite uh, San Diego facts is it's one of the top 25 biodiversity hotspots in the whole globe. Wow. It has of the 2,200 plant families in the, in the world, there's 1,800 represented natively in San Diego. So the the potential in biodiversity is already there in its foundations. And so, you know, we have such an amazing capacity of cultivation in there. I knew nothing of that about San Diego. That's absolutely stunning, remarkable. Wow. So you're in the right place, <laughs> 100%. So, so tell us, maybe you can define food sovereignty. Yeah, totally. Uh, so uh, when I think about food sovereignty, it's, uh, I start to think about how our, our ancestors and our um, previous generations had the ability to, to grow all their own food, right? To be able to, within the community that we lived in, to be able to trade resources and goods and um, be able to, to limit that need for external inputs. And so for me, when I think about food sovereignty, it's how to take back that autonomy and ability to, uh, to provide for myself, both in my food and my medicine. And how that relationship is developed actually has a lot to do with our culture. And a lot of our cultures have this history of interaction with the land and the natural spaces. Yeah. And it's just because of convenience has changed over time, right? The modification of, of goods and, and earth and materials has shifted how we perceive food and medicine in these ways. And so for me, it's um, when I think about food sovereignty and medicine sovereignty, it's this opportunity to go back to those traditional practices of how we related to the land and how we had an understanding of where our food came from. And so that's what I'm uh, looking to practice within my own life and then share how I've been able to do that with others. So that way, you know, it can be a, um, a larger regenerative movement and solution. The question of the commons comes up for me because particularly in San Diego, land is incredibly expensive. And so to be able to provide some kind of... Um, common access is going to require a different model than what we've currently got. I'm wondering how you address that, how you conceive of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one of the things I think about with that is the ways in which we're managing our ecological spaces. Um, it, it, it often comes from one that's disassociated from those traditions that I mentioned earlier. Right. And so an example is where I'm studying the oak woodlands and the oak woodlands, uh, as I participate in them and in, interact with indigenous communities, I'm I'm understanding that they're actually food forests, right? From the acorns to the hunting that can happen underneath to all the different medicines and tubers and other things that are gathered in the in the understory. Uh, with the way that we've managed woodlands, oak woodlands particularly, is as wild spaces, wild lands. And so what we're seeing is then the, the orchard has become overgrown and it's too dense and now it's become volatile for fires. And so we're starting to see that through that human interaction or the lack of human interaction in this case, it's making the native spaces, natural spaces more volatile. And so in that aspect, I start to think about, well, there's actually a lot of, of room. There's a lot of space that is not being cared for in the highest that has a lot of biomass and outputs that could be um, you know, cycled back into the system in a more holistic and, and regenerative way. 
And so that's what actually got me really interested in silvopasture, which is the use of livestock underneath orchards and trees and forests to help manage invasives, to kind of substitute for fire as a, a fertilization mechanism and a, a weed management tool. So, you know, I really feel like if we, like you said, took a more um, mindful and uh, regenerative approach to how we manage open spaces and natural lands, even preserve lands, then we would be able to actually become more bioregionally regenerative because the capacity of shifting those biomasses into something like, you know, meat through sheep or into more uh, medicinal native products. I think that there's a way of building more reciprocity with the land and having that socially empowering exchange. I think we'd have to change some fundamental social assumptions around that, because even with if you're talking about animals and grazing, we have this whole ownership thing going that isn't really related to a, a notion of commons. Right. Yeah. So I mean, and that that's a that's a big, big challenge for us to face socially, for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, because uh, private spaces, you know, have their perks and benefits and challenges at the same time as public spaces. Right. And so I, I kind of dance in both worlds. Right. Because as a public nonprofit, oh. I am going after partnerships and grants. Um, like right now, I'm a part of a planning grant through the Wildlife Conservation Board for a restoration project where we're gonna be removing a grove of eucalyptus trees that are in a riparia zone adjacent to a, a native preserve. So, you know, how to go about that process, how to manage the biomass that comes out of it, how to, um, you know, encourage that connection to that open space and tell those stories. Uh, there's, there's just so much in that learning of public space where you have this kind of collective envisionment and like kind of like a, a rule book to, to to navigate that can be really empowering, but also be extremely debilitating in like time and resources required to get to the end result. Whereas public spare private spaces, oftentimes you have less restrictions and you can do a lot more more quickly. But also that means that if you don't know how to plan for the future, you can do a lot more damage more quickly as well. So I think that what's going to happen is, you know, we're in a world where money and the exchange and value of, of resources and energy is uh, valued in that with that resource or with that tool. And the more we can show the impact through these practices of having that bottom line met or having successful businesses and resources come from the work, you know, that's the whole idea of like valuing ecosystem services, where there's a way of acknowledging that the carbon benefits and the sequestration benefits and the, the resources and care that go into it are mutually beneficial, both of the ecology and the social and cultural yeah. relationships. So there should be some type of monetization exchange to encourage people to make better choices. And one of those things that right now is going to be the, the, the private market and the value of effective grazing going well. And those kind of strategies start to get in comparison to mechanical treatments that are dependent upon fossil fuels and um, highly labor intensive, right? So that's what I'm kind of giving a, a, a push against as like an alternative. And, you know, for some situations, there's it's, it's gonna be a lot more effective to take the machinery in there, do the initial treatment, come back later, address the, the invasives with the animals in a more uh, a slower, softer approach. And I think that's what's really exciting right now is that the folks who have their environmental exemptions and have their management plans in place for the forest, they're looking for something different and they are trying to find more progressive solutions. And so it really does come down to like, how does the dollar pan out? Like, can they do it at a relative rate compared to the mechanical treatment for the grazing? And if so, they want to try it and see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, then what can we learn? And that's the research I'm really excited about. So you're do primarily doing research is and consulting is that Yeah, so research and consulting and then also the the hope is to do workforce development because we want to be able to build curricula to show how these various strategies can be implemented and then finding certain situations like right now I'm working in an avocado orchard that I was the water was turned off years ago and so a lot of them are standing dead 
But with the amount of rains we've been getting over the last few years, a lot of them are revegetating. Wow. And so it's really cool to like think, well, a lot of San Diego and anywhere south of Santa Barbara, really, if they have avocado groves, a lot of them are just turning off the water because they can't even break even. So being able to kind of consider what is a transition from those avocado groves look like into a more regenerative biodiverse food forest and what kind of species, trees, understory, all of that can I in, in, incorporate into these zones to, to see a, a growth and a regeneration that is actually able to revitalize what was essentially a kind of a, a lost cause. And um, so I'm really excited about that potential because again, there's not a lot of research being done in that kind of scope. So, so yeah, so in some manner I'm doing personal kind of research to, because I have ideas about solutions I think could be effective and I'm trying to implement them. And that's where right now I'm, as I'm landing in these spaces, I'm able to start writing about what my intentions are, start looking for grants and foundations that would be interested in supporting these kind of projects. And, and that's kind of where I'm excited to have other partners on site that can help me with like curriculum development and some of the other pieces that, again, aren't my specializations. Well, so one of the things that we love to do is to network and connect people to other people. So if you can you name more specifically even what kind of partners you're looking for in terms of curriculum development, in terms of what other 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 facets? Yeah, sure. So um, so I would say right now we're in a capacity building phase of our journey. Uh, so we're starting to build a lot of the infrastructure and get those base kind of um, uh, accommodations settled. So that way we can start implementing. So things like, you know, with um, with the animal husbandry, we need to be able to have the right facilities for handling the animals, make it convenient for us to be able to move them around to the different zones. And uh, so a lot of those kind of just basic uh, supports come through, you know, ca capacity building. And so uh, I would say a lot of the, the hope that I have around partnerships are right now with ideally with foundations and organizations that have an interest in seeing these kind of strategies implemented. And so that's, that's my like number one. And then the second piece of it is um, we're looking for folks that have um, experience in these kind of strategies, traditional ecological knowledge and agriculture practices as a whole. Um, so a lot of our uh, intention is to partner with indigenous communities right. and um, and be able to support that collective uh, empowerment of strategies and um, opportunity for growth, um, because, you know, so many things have been um, have been stolen from indigenous people and stolen from people of color, you know, and permaculture is a good example of that, where a lot of those mm -hmm. traditions are actually built upon natural farming and traditional agriculture practices and you know to to you know not include the indigenous communities and the asian communities that were you know already doing these practices you know there's i mean especially like animal husbandry from mongolia to peru you know to to the middle east right like there's all these tribal communities that have have lived on the land lived with the land for since time immemorial so we're looking for other partners like that that have experience. Um, we're inviting uh, Mongolian shepherds, nomadic shepherds from Mongolia to come help teach some of our programs. So we're doing like cultural visas as a long-term intention to have that cultural exchange happen, um, especially in a time when, like you said, we need a full social cultural shift. And for me, the embodiment of practice is the only way I really see that happening. And so we do, our, we want to draw people in that are actually ready to show up, dig holes, dig trenches, put in time, right? And, mm -hmm. and work with the animals, work with the land and the trees. And, um, you know, and then eventually be able to have that educational structure to develop an apprenticeship program that results in the ability to be employed through uh, projects that we're able to acquire and then empower through purpose in place by identifying how we can continue those projects and their long-term maintenance through the support of the students that go through our apprenticeship program. So ideally it's like a onboarding process where you're educated. We have projects that we need to implement. So we're able to provide hands-on learning through those projects. 
And then oh. ideally we identify folks who are um, able to take on a larger role in a particular area, ideally that they grew up in or um, are regionally connected to and give them long-term stable jobs and employment and careers that are actually going to be nourishing for their whole being, right? And their community. Wow, that's a, that's a lot. It's beautiful. I want to ask you about the urban food forest. This is in San Diego. And is it one area or so, is it- so so that's an interesting question because so it's been fascinating for me of like seeing the community garden space. We have over 100 community gardens in San Diego wow. and a lot of them have fruit trees. So it's and then it was interesting because as I worked with them, I started to say, well, hey, like how do we institutionalize fruit trees going into public parks? Right. You would think it would be a hand in hand, like community gardens, community orchards, public parks. Well, there was actually in city of San Diego, uh, a, a rule that was not allowing fruit trees to be planted within public park systems. So I went through all this process of jumping through hoops of talking with city planners, talking with other colleagues who could, you know, help me try to get to the bottom of this. Finally spoke with someone in code compliance that was able to get me to a point of saying, well, let's look this up. All we have to do is make this adjustment to this code and it allow Food, you know, fruit trees and orchards to be incorporated into public park spaces in a in open open park open open spaces. So it it took a couple of years, but um, eventually that went to vote. It passed, and so now uh, fruit trees are allowed in city of San Diego public park systems because of me really just like kind of pushing to say like we got to have this. And and because I wanted to, I want to plant it. I was like, hey, I want I want to. Put 300 trees in a, in a this you know two acre parcel and like just have tons of food right there while it's surrounded by you know um apartment buildings you know a lot of people of color and low income in that community directly adjacent to a bus stop right next to a library right next to a mercado like i mean it was just so obvious and you know just i ran into those challenges of well it's not able to be zoned that way who's going to manage it and all those kind of nuances of, of public public works um but yeah that so so that was kind of what started my journey and then that ended up where i i really just leaned into like where was the spaces already kind of there and a lot of them were those community gardens they were like um you know uh private places you know like you know uh, a lot of churches now have their gardens and so um so then I just started uh, sharing more about how to manage, uh, how to do the fruit tree pruning. Um, we have some spaces in Balboa Park that have that have fruit trees there, um, community centers. And so I, I just started really leaning into those pieces. And so there's food forests throughout San Diego scattered in all these little pockets. And so, and my dream is still just like macro food forests. So, you know, on the 101 acres that I'm on, it's we're starting, you know, starting from one zone and just going to start expanding across. Um, but yeah, teaching people how you can put food in really small places. And, you know, I've, I've had quarter acre plots and, you know, just little hillsides and 10, 12, 20 trees and just get it in there. Three, five years later, all of a sudden, it's just, you know, you got a lot of food coming. You know, I, I, it's bringing to mind again, cultural challenges because we live in such a litigious society right so if you what i imagine the first thing that people would do is say keep keep your hands off the fruit trees <laughs> don't eat, don't eat the fruit for one and i could imagine you know then fruit will fall and it'll rot and you know then there's animals that are going to come around and that could be perceived as a liability and what if somebody eats something and gets sick and you know because our mindset is so twisted at this point it toward uh toward lawsuits and and protection and and pitting each other against each other so I, I think there needs to be a cultural education along with this to say this is available to us but then I can also imagine some people going in and picking all the apples and selling them and, and leaving none for every uh, other people so you know it's it's interesting 
to in thinking about that to look at how do we move from this me mine more kind of mentality to there's enough for everybody and taking taking as we need and and not more so i'm wondering do you have do you have any insights into that? Because it's I can see where that's a real challenge for them. Yeah, no, you hit it. It's exactly right. It's like um, you know, like getting the right of entry on the at the park, right? All getting all those kind of pieces in order because if it's not on the general the general plan for the park, you know, then okay, is it a usable? Is it a an allowable use in that zone, right? Or does it need to go to council and then get voted upon and have like community input and all those things? So. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's like it's uh, the trees are going to make a mess. And so who's going to clean it up? And, you know, so so, you know, it's again, it's a social challenge. Right. So what I realized is that what we need are organizations that are willing to have a vested interest in those strategies. So um, a couple that come to mind are like we have one in California called the California Rare Fruit Growers. And there's, a, you know, chapters in each county um, in California, as well as in Texas and Florida. And it's really great because they're focused on education and empowering people around growing specialty fruit trees. So, um, you know, these are the types of folks that'll teach you how to prune your fruit trees, right? And they can uh, advise you on grafting and help you with, you know, taking cuttings of your pomegranates and things like that. And so I see that those those spaces and also things like um, we have our cooperative extensions programs and our master gardeners programs. And so these organizations are already structured to be providing those services. They just need a place to be able to implement. So I see it as really just um, an organizational challenge, right? Is that if we could line it up in such a manner, the 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 powers that be want to see these kind of things happen because they know it's important, but they're, like you said, concerned about who's going to manage it in, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, who's going to be liable and responsible for maintenance and water and upkeep and all those things. So I, I think it's like the paradigm shift that is going to happen is once those types of things get validated and the time and cost and expenses get clear, then we're going to really compare it to like mowing the grass and spraying the Roundup and saying, well, this seems actually not only is it cost us less, but it's ecologically, environmentally more mindful. And then it produces something that we can then say, well, hey, we can load up some food boxes for donation or there's a distribution mechanism to support that participation where maybe it's like the local schools in the area. A lot of the schools wanted to come to those food forests and participate as an educational outdoor learning center, right? And so there's a lot of sociocultural pieces that can work into the bioregional economical component, right? The economy component is really important. And COVID was a good example of like, where's our food coming from? How far does it have to go? Do we have to wait for it to get off a boat from China? And now it's, you know, months out. So I think that got people really thinking again of like, what are we going to do when these kind of situations come up? And so I think that now more than ever is the time to really kind of push that bar a little bit of like, implement these strategies, realize that there's a mechanism for social management and, and uh, environmental management that is just Oh, it's a it's a pivot, right? It's not a big change. You just now you, instead of educating the 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 staff on how to run a, a a lawnmower, you're educating them on how to prune a fruit tree, right? There's there's uh, um, just an educational gap, and so that's also where I'm seeing Mongol tribe being able to step into some of those roles of instead of that you could do it this way, and here's how we can talk about it and be more more aware and mindful of those needs. And so I, I really feel like um, once we make that transition and there's good examples, just like I saw with the seed library, we uh, started the, the seed library in Ocean Beach and it, um, it was really kind of an organic unfolding. I had a couple colleagues who, uh, who reached out to me about it because they're like, hey, we saw your presentations about seed libraries and the value of them as a socio-cultural uh, exchange tool. And um, they were like, how do we start one? Let's get together and start one. So we uh, we got together and opened uh, the seed library in Ocean Beach Public Library, which is part of the San Diego Public Library system. And after we had that launch, 
Um, we, we were able to get a bunch of seed donations. We started seeing that exchange locally and then COVID hit and it was literally less than a year, uh, after we had opened the seed library that, that the shutdown happened and we got so many requests for seeds and we were able to provide seeds throughout the, the, the lockdown. And so it was just really amazing because the timing couldn't have been better, right? We had this system institutionalized to a point where we could use Facebook and all these other tools to get the distribution, mail them out and all those things. And so I, it was really beautiful. Then after that unfolding, when things became, you know, more, we became more able to connect again, we had six other libraries pop up, uh, seed libraries pop up within the San Diego Public Library system. Wow. And so it just organically started to, because we have, again, a large cultivation gardening community here that people saw that and they said, well, we want that in our library. And every librarian I've talked to is like, let's do it. And it's just a procedural organizational thing. And then each library is going to be different. Each one, the more support you have from like a friends of the library group or a, um, a local master gardeners or, you know, other gardening group, you get those garden clubs together with the, with the friends of the libraries and they'll usually combine to help operate it or to at least like, you know, support the development of it. And so it's, I, I kind of see like those systems are going to be, it's going to happen the same with the food forests because the resiliency that we need in our bioregions around food uh, is going to require something like that to come forth where all of a sudden you have 300 fruit trees of, you know, all different sorts that actually, not only is it an educational learning center and a production space, but it's actually a source of, of biomass for replication for either grafting, cutting, seeds, all of that nursery stock. And so then it's essentially a living library, a living seed library, a living repository of, of natural foods. And so I think that once we start to, once we make that transition into that awareness, it's going to be spread out really quickly and institutionalized at a larger scope. But again, those are my, that's my, how, what I've been seeing and how I imagine it unfolding. And I know it's going to take time, but I do see that now is the right kind of, you know, social scope for that. Let's get, well, first, I, before we get into specifics about the seed library, because I think that's, that's an, action that so many of us can get engaged in pretty much wherever we are that's going to make a big difference. I just want to understand with the food forests, are they being cultivated organically? I mean, what are, are they going to be sprayed? You know, like how do we, what kind of management is around that? What kind of parameters? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a exclusively organic and regenerative strategies. Um, you know, there's there's always a dozen options that can be pursued before we apply chemicals. And so I think that we're again, we're just in a in such a fast paced society that we want a solution right away. It's easier to just go spray the chemical on it once a year for six years straight than it is to. That would be another put... one of my concerns. Yeah. So it has to be one of those things where what we're actually doing then is kind of moving towards more of a syntropic agriculture approach where you have to try and select specific plants and species and cultivars that are bioregionally appropriate, try them out and do it in a bunch of spots in your region, you know, do it on the coast at, you know, 30 elevation and do it in the foothills at 1600 elevation and do it in the mountains at 3000 elevation and take the same 10 peaches and try them in all the places see what happens, compare notes, you know, and that's the only way as scientists, like when I think about it, you gotta, you gotta try it and then you'll know. And, and the, the challenge that I'm seeing is that that information is only being shared amongst people who are part of those garden clubs that are just doing it because they're passionate about it. And now they're retired and they have time and they own their property. And, you know, they're like, I want to do this because I'm interested. Whereas in the public side of it, it's like, what's convenient, right? What grows tall really fast, like eucalyptus, what's not messy, right? And most of those plants are not native to San Diego. And the only benefit they're really providing to the ecology is that they're drinking a bunch of the stormwater or they're, you know, 
reducing some erosion in times. But when I think about the value of the right tree in the right place, it's more multifaceted. And the more we can kind of look at, at stacking functions in that way, I think that that's where right now, like ecologically, we've just been so, so far behind and kind of stuck because there's a series of organizations or industries like the nurserymen that really influence what happens in those landscaping spheres. So I think that that right now is, is like part of the paradigm shift that we're witnessing is who's got the power, who's got the resources, who's willing to invest in these ideas and alternative strategies. And are we willing to be patient and know that, hey, we may lose a few trees here and there because of certain pests. And then what happens? How do we address those pests? What is a like, what is a natural or organic solution? Or is it just that we need to say this one doesn't work in this area because it attracts those pests? And is there ones that we're noticing that are not affected by those pests? And what can we learn from that? And so that's where I think like the long-term research that I'm hoping to establish and set up is one that, you know, would be picked up and supported by the local institutions. Because again, like it, it's not, I'm, I'm not doing this just for me. I'm doing this with the seven generations concept in mind, right? That what I plant now, I'm hoping my grandchildren will eat from. And that relationship for me as like being able to start my career in such a way has been really inspiring and empowering because then I'm meeting a lot of these different folks across the industries that have been doing it for 40, 50 years. They've made their career out of like navigating this and they're very supportive of me and helping me along this way. So I've been really grateful to have advisors and being in San Diego, like you said, is really the right place for me. Uh, just given the time and, and the way things are going. You mentioned the eucalyptus again. And before we talk about the seed libraries, I want to, you were talking about how you're remediating eucalyptus. And I was wondering if you might share why. Yeah. So uh, the eucalyptus trees uh, are from Australia. And I would, they, when they were planted here, um, there's a, a First off, like the Spanish brought them as uh, colonizers, you know, and they planted them all over as indicators for when they were in the ships at sea, it could be a marking point of where they should, where they should land. And so, um, so that aspect of it to me is like, you know, fundamentally there's a, there's a reason why I kind of am, I've always been like struggling to understand why the eucalyptus are here. And then when I heard that story is like, okay, that makes sense. And start to look at those areas of the whole west coast where they were landing and i mean the eucalyptus trees there's massive groves and they outcompete uh the the oak trees and the other native trees because they're a lot faster growing uh the challenge with them you know they call them widow makers in australia because they're shallow rooted and the wind will blow them over really easily and so uh in in our soil conditions in the west coast they 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 can grow really quickly and really well, but then they get really tall and then the winds come through, coastal winds blow them over. Um, the the other thing that they do is that their leaves uh, uh, change the pH of the soil. They actually acidify the soil, uh, which to an extent can be good, but in our can, in our case, it's actually creating a duff layer that doesn't allow any of our native species to really establish well into them. So it, again, it's creating um, it's colonizing the soils. In a, in a chemical way and uh, creating a space that doesn't allow for the biodiversity potentials that that could exist alternatively. Um, so for me, like I think about all those pieces and then just socially, like there's so many big eucalyptus that are right near houses or on the edges of roads. I mean, I remember seeing a story about one falling on and crushing a lady in her car. Like, I mean, it's just wild. Like I just don't understand why they're even allowed in public parks. And then I hear stories like, oh, there's there's this social attachment to this grove that, you know, you know, someone donated a tree and it got planted there. And it's like, I hear that, but also, you know, they're a danger to our community. And ecologically speaking, they're 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 limiting the capacity of what our systems could could support. So for me, it's things like that where they're, you know, and they're a landscaper's dream for the longest time because they grow fast and put a lot of shade out. And so that whole like side of it is, again, it's, um, it's a social change. And I think once we start to become more aware, 
of what could be or what was, we realize that, you know, two, 300 years, 500 years that these trees have been introduced is not a long time. And there's tens of thousands of years of historic evidence around like oak trees and the food production and the biodiversity beneath them. So it's kind of for me as an ecologist, I, I, I can't really be favoring the eucalyptus tree if I really am acknowledging the history of, of the region. That's such an interesting point, because again, it speaks to the importance of natives, native species, and that certain ecologies are built for certain species or thrive with certain species, and uh, that the invasives are, are um, ecology killers. In, on such a deep level. I think there's more and more conversation, more and more awareness about that growing currently, which is really um, heartening to see that happening. And also you mentioned oaks and my understanding is that oaks are a keystone species and they're so deeply important to a greater ecology. I, I'm wondering if you might take a minute to speak to that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They are a keystone species, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of foresters and ecologists that speak about that. And um, one of the things that I love about the oaks is that they're a mycelial based system, right? They're connected through their roots, and they share resources. That's so, part of what makes them a keystone species, right? Yeah, exactly. And and the ability to to connect that neural network of mycelia and fungal systems. And to be able to see chemical exchanges through those is um, where I, I started to really process the, the how alive the soil actually is within those areas of the forest. And I started to think about like when we're doing restoration work, like we're planting seedlings and we're planting saplings. Well, you can't just plant the sapling way over there, away from the trees where you think it should grow. You have to like be close enough to where those networks can touch. And if we're not being considerate of that, then, you know, we probably wouldn't think about gathering some of the soil mycorrhizals and bacteria and, and fungus within the systems below those mother trees and encouraging and mixing that with the soils of the saplings that we're planting out, right? Those simple systems of connection are actually like very, very rooted in um, the the animistic traditions of a lot of indigenous communities, just that like everything is alive and is connected and has its relationships and serves its 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 purpose. And so I, I one of the things I loved learning about oaks was that they're fire adapted. And so when you start to think about the relationship with fire and oaks, it starts to make a lot more sense when we talk about cultural burning, right? We had vast oak forests and they underneath them were scattered shrubs and medicines and flowers and herbs and the the fires that were set by indigenous communities were controlled burns to essentially uh, help with the vegetation management and so uh, it would restore soil health and nutrition to the soil it helps process down uh, dead woody matter and and biomass that is just you know, it's, it's more valuable cycled rather than sitting. Um, and what was really neat to learn is that the relationships that the oaks actually have with fire, not only do they have the ability to protect themselves once they get old enough by growing thick bark, but they mm -hmm. actually are intelligent and aware enough to sense when the fire's coming. So the smoke gets uh, underneath the, the canopy and the leaves and the tree are responsive to the smoke to where they actually bring water from deep in the in the ground up to the surface so that way they can protect the surface roots because that's a lot of your feeder roots and so uh, an indigenous auntie shared this with me and i was just like it made so much sense to me logically because she she is like you know they do this and then after you after because when they cultural burn they would set up their piles so that way the smoke would go underneath the trees and so it would encourage this and and i started to think about you know, when she told me, yeah, you would, you, after the smokes come out, you actually start to hear like a hissing sound where the, the, the water and the steam and all that protective energy is now within that surface layers. And, and then I started to think about 
the relationship between acorns and the processing of how you have to have water to wash out the tannins. And so as they're grinding in the metates, they would have water to, to cycle the tannins out. And at the time I was in Palomar mountain and I was, I was full into my, my studies there. And I am surrounded by metates. I'm sitting in these zones and thinking about the indigenous communities being there, doing their, doing, preparing their food. And as she was telling me about this, I started to think, well, I have a really strong inclination that when those oaks were healthy and that relationship that they had with the forest was in balance, that they had, there was so much more water available just because of the, the math, the basic math of like, there's less trees, they're larger trees, and they're doing that work of deeper pulling of osmotic potential of the water to the surface. And then I started to realize this is why the springs aren't active anymore. So we have so many springs in those those headwaters and those forests that that were oaks, and a lot of them are dry now because we're seeing hyperdensity in our oak woodlands because they haven't been pruned and thinned. Where you should have 35 large trees per acre, you're seeing like 300 to 500 trees in the same zone, but they're all smaller trees, and you know only like they harvested maybe... all the big trees. Yeah. Right. And then we haven't had that natural cycle in balance in so long that now we have a big age gap in a lot of our stands where you have really old trees and really young trees. And in San Diego, we have a beetle that's killing all of our mature, like productive age trees from 30 to 70 years old. So we're not even getting to the 200, 200 year old trees anymore because we're losing a lot of those trees that are, you know, in that productive window. So it's it's been really fascinating just to see how how the oaks in that relationship are actually there. They help us pre prevent the fires by managing a more healthy ecosystem in our headwaters and actually drawing more water out into that surface and holding water more effectively then because when the water is present in those surface layers, it just it's going to have that osmotic potential to, to hold it in the soil. And the oaks, they grind out all the aquifers. They grind out all the the um, the decomposing granite and make basins. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's just amazing. They're they're definitely my favorite tree. Like if that doesn't isn't obvious at this point. Yeah, you just lit up talking about them. What is a matate? A matate is um a, you know, a mortar and pestle. You okay. know, so it's a uh, it's and and in Palomar, there a lot of them are in the DG where they're just in a big, like kind of um, a big stone and they've just been worked. And now you have this, these deep pits. Some of them are shallow depressions, but some I've seen eight, 10 inches deep. And uh, yeah, the, they're, whenever you find a metate, it's, it's, um, it's really beautiful because that relationship with the oaks is directly correlated. And so um, the site that I was working on was a ceremonial site where the indigenous community would go to 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 do spiritual spiritual work, and uh, it it was on the way to their village site up in Palomar Mountain, and that's where the black oaks are, which is their their choice uh, for for food consumption, and yeah, so it's really beautiful to they see. They use the metates to process the acorns into flour. Yeah, so they would make the acorn meal and then you know uh, use that. It's almost I I describe it kind of like a tortilla. It was like a like a, a, a carrier for them, they can, you know, grab their veggies or grab their dip in their soups and things like that. So great. Yeah. Really now with all that enthusiasm over the oaks, let's talk about seed libraries. And and the seed libraries are also dealing with native cultivars, right? Yeah, it's both like native plants and you know, our local Audubon Society is is strictly focused on native native species and seeds. Um, so they're actually providing a lot of seed to uh, little libraries that and folks that have uh, are hosting libraries. Um, and yeah, and then exclusively heirlooms, um, you know, non-GMO, nothing that is um, coming from, you know, those those big agrochemical companies that are destroying the world. Um, so can you be really specific on how did you start a seed library? Because I'm sure that there are people that would love to be able to do this with their local libraries. Yeah, so um, 
basically it starts with having the conversation with the li head librarian, right? You have to have somebody at the library who's willing to, to value that, that function, that service. And it's perfect. Librarians love seed libraries because they already are curating, you know, a, an organizational relationship with literature and to be able to have that through, um, you know, a biological is it's, they already know the right questions to ask. How do we store it? You know, how do we, how do we share it? How, you know, all those, you know, specific things that, um, that are these details. And what's beautiful is that uh, I've found such receptivity from the library community as a whole that that part I feel is really easy. It just make that connection, go to your local library, talk with the branch manager, say, hey, I would love to see a seed library here. Would that be something you're open to? You know, uh, and then and then it comes down to the funding, right? Is like, how do you start it? What is who's going to maintain it? How do you get your seeds? Um, you know, there's there like envelopes and things like that. There's there's a few kind of like fundamental needs in order to be able to service the library. Um, but a lot of that is like it's really low low entry, right? So can it we comes. Get, down, can we get more specific about that? Like what, yeah, like examples of funding sources and how do you get the seeds and what kind yeah. of process? What kind of delivery system is there? A distribution system. Yeah, so uh, so to start, I would say once you get the approval and you and the the branch manager says, yeah, we love this idea. Um, it's going to be uh, it seeing like in our case, we had a, um, one of the library aides was was really inspired by the project. And um, when they were when the library was in full swing, uh, that was a twenty hour commitment from that seat that library aide to provide the service of the seed library exclusively. Um, twenty so, hours a week. Yeah, twenty. Yeah, so that um, you know is a it's a solid responsibility, and and this is um, you know acquiring seed, uh, sorting and packaging, um, because basically uh, the the simplest way. To, to distribute it is that you would prepackage all of the seeds into like, let's say, you know, let's say you buy a standard seed pack of tomatoes, it has 50 seeds in it, you'd put five tomato seeds in a, in 10 pouches, right? And so then you have that to share now with 10 people. Um, and so that's kind of, if you imagine the simplified version of it, right? And in that way, you can load up an old card catalog, which is like the most fun way to to kind of you know re you know restore that relationship with card catalogs because most libraries have one sitting around somewhere, and uh, those are really easy to pull them up, label them out. Some of them are really big. We got one from um, from University of San Diego that came out of their old library, and um, and it was it's huge. I mean, this thing has got to have like you know 50, 50 drawers in it. And so how you sort it and how you organize it, it's going to be, you know, unique. I like sorting by season. I think that's really great and helpful is you're like, okay, just this season here is spring when you would plant it versus summer and winter and all that. So um, you could sort it by crop type, you know, tomatoes, beans, squash, like that. Um, but it really is going to come down to what kind of seeds you end up getting. And uh, there's you know, in regards to funding, like the first funding source almost always is going to be your friends of the library. So the friends of the library, you know, you can get $200, $500, maybe $1,000 from a friends of the library group. And that can go towards, you know, uh, having an event, getting some some food to support people that come out, maybe pay a presenter to, to be there, and then to cover kind of your initial costs of your seeds, because maybe you're going to buy seeds in bulk. Right, gonna um, you know turtle tree biodynamic or some you know native seed search some of those kind of you know uh, heirloom and and local seed companies. So you My you just, that's actually information that I'd like to highlight to um, to name some of these companies and and if you have any kind of resource that lists these to let us know how might we access that. Do you have that on a website? Yeah, I'll I'll share some links with you so that way you can share them with the viewers and um and you can yeah because speak, speak a couple of those links right now if you would because people are hearing us hopefully on their podcast channels too totally 
Yeah. So some of the companies that I like are, you know, if you look up any type of um, like wind pollinated or naturally pollinated, like uh, Turtle Tree Biodynamic is a good seed company that's doing wind pollinated biodynamic pollination. Um, Native Seed Search is a great place to like start looking for different seeds. Um, there are like a variety of other organic seed companies like Mary's and Johnny's. Some of the bigger ones are kind of hit and miss. Um, it's easier to find bulk seed oftentimes from them, but I always support local seed companies. Like here in San Diego, we have a San Diego seed company, um, you know, small, small local grower, uh, organic production. And, um, so, and yeah, and then, um, I am a big proponent of slow food there. They have a program called, um, the arc of taste. And it's basically like a specialty heirloom list that incorporates more like cultural stories around the seeds, as well as just the fact that they're heirlooms. Um, and that lists animals as well. So I, I have an heirloom sheep, rare uh, uh, arc of taste sheep with the Navajo churros. So yeah, so that's, um, that's, those are great starting places. And um, yeah, and I'll, I'll make sure to, to send a reference list of some others. Um, there's, there's definitely, you know, there's a lot of politics in seeds and that's one of the challenges with it. It's like, you know, there's, there's theft of indigenous seeds. There's, you know, all these, um, these aspects of, of like you hit, you know, with like chemicals being sprayed on them, you know, all these other, you know, biological challenges within it, but the social challenges are, you know, often more complex. -y. Um, so yeah, I'll make sure to share some of those lists. That would be great. And for everyone listening, you'll be able to find those resources on our website at sustainabilitynow.global. Um, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the social challenges and the politics of seed. Yeah. So one of the stories that always hits me is like um, there used to be a whole bunch of seed harvesting uh, tools and equipment throughout this country. And uh, systematically, um, you know, the, the the litigation, again, like you said, around seed harvesting um, because of uh, genetic patents around seeds, uh, that that has been the biggest, you know, difficulty in when when it comes to seed management and active actively harvesting and saving seeds in this country um, is that you have you know, a full litigation team funded massively going after small seed producers and farmers. And um, that's been happening for the last uh, 20, 30 years. And so there are not, and those machines aren't really being made very often anymore, mind you. So what's happened is actually we're seeing a lot of small like winnowing devices and a lot more like homesteading size um, tools and equipment starting to come out, which I think is really cool. That's like the the progressive nature of, of farmers and, and humans um, is that, yeah, we're just having to localize. And so a lot of the, a lot of those social challenges really are because um, people are still so disconnected from their food that they don't even understand that those big four agrochemical companies are, are you know, they hold like 95% of the seed. And, and, you know, they have patents on things that um, they can lock things up and make it impossible to get. And, and that part of it is that the social paradigm, I think, where, you know, we, we can only take back sovereignty through, through spreading it, right? We have to, like, everybody has to be involved. And if, if everybody's involved, then, you know, you can't target one person. So that's when I think about seed sovereignty and food sovereignty and that, that's where, Seed libraries are something that needs to be institutionalized in order to make sure that we have good seed and good materials and resources available. And that means like every community garden should have a seed library, every school, every like, you know, all as many of those institutions as we can. But the challenge then is going to be where does the seed come from? Are we growing seed locally? Are we making it regionally adaptive then? Because you know, what grows in, in, you know, Northern California isn't always going to grow well in Southern California. Maybe there's a pocket in Sonoma that's similar to San Diego, where we do find that regional similarity, but that's again, going to only come through that active research and exchange. And, and right now people are just so accepting of what is that they, most people don't realize that the potential of flavor diversity and nutritional diversity that could come from having that kind of um, regionally available resource. Yeah. 
Well, what's what's coming to mind is that different plants require different conditions and different planting uh, practices. So with each of these, the five seeds of the tomato, for instance, that someone is receiving, do they get instructions as well? Yeah. So to, to follow up on those, those thoughts of it, like distribution is that the idea is that the seed library would also be providing some form of education about like planting and starting seeds and how to save seeds, um, that those books about those, uh, those strategies would be made front and center available. And so we start seeing a higher demand for those resources. And then that means we can spend more for those books to get more copies and things like that. So uh, the, the hope is that not only does it inspire people to pursue knowledge on their own, but it, we have to be able to build that bridge to those other garden clubs and other groups and community gardens. So to me, when I think about social and cultural components within this is that if we meet at the library and we have that connection, and then we meet at the community garden and we have that connection, then maybe we'll meet at the dinner table and have that connection. And we'll start to learn more about each other, right? And, and I think that that's the human element that for me is continuing to be so inspiring because, you know, again, we all have to eat, right? And so that movement of slow food around like having good, clean, fair food for all, like that, there's these fundamental ethics that within my being makes, they're so obvious that that's where I'm like, I can't go back now to eating conventional produce because I know too much about what's happening that I like, it's like for me, vo then voting that I, it's okay to abuse, you know, my, my other BIPOC community who's out there harvesting those and not being valued in their time. And so that to me, it's like, it, it's such a bigger social paradigm that, um, yeah, it's like education is like at the fundamental heart of it. If we don't know that we're capable of growing it or how challenging it is to grow a tomato, then when we see it for $5 in the store, it's like, I don't know, this one's $3. Why is it $3? And you start to see, okay, well, it's $3 because they used all these chemicals on it and they abused their labor. And this one's $5 because it was grown locally and organic and they're actually having fair compensation. I mean, you start to really understand those things when you are participating in it. And that that's, I think, where the seed libraries and the food forest, the whole hope of it is to like make it accessible and then encourage people to, even if we're just growing some culinary herbs, just grow something. So you have a relationship with your food and with plants and, you know, maybe that'll inspire others to, you know, to shift out of that status quo business as usual operation into something that is more, self self-aware and communally empowering so with the seed library do people pay for the seeds are they no so that's where the funding comes in the funding yes. to provide the seeds and provide the labor to distribute the seeds and then people request them and then is there a program by which people can reseed from their own to contribute back to the library yeah, so that that part of it is the burning question of most seed libraries. Um, one, it's uh, saving seed is a whole different process than growing produce. So there is, you know, because, uh, you know, produce, you're usually harvesting it when it's ripe. Seeds, oftentimes you have to have a longer growth phase for it to either dry down or to actually even produce seed. Um, so the challenge with having uh, having public return seeds in their production is that it's the skill level of the gardener, the difficulty of that seed to be saved. Um, is it self-pollinated? Is it insect pollinated, wind pollinated? So there's definitely a scale of like easy, medium, hard expert, right? And so it's one of those, again, social needs of we have to be able to empower people and encourage them, but we also have to meet them where they're at. So if, if someone's new and inexperienced, but they want to contribute, it's like find a seed that's going to be really easy for them to save, something that's self-fertile, like a tomato, right? And so that relationship can then be established where 
the tomato, you, you don't need a lot of tomatoes to get a lot of seed. So that uh, connection of like, you get to still get the fruit, you still get to eat it, you still get to enjoy it. And you also get to save some seed, right? And that part of it is where it's good to encourage that connection and and build that relationship. But also it might be an opportunity to do a little bit of kind of um, foundation education work and get people a certificate saying, I know how to save seeds of this sort and this type. And so I find that that's kind of where, again, it, the big gap is going to be is that Someone like me can say, yeah, I really like this seed and I want to grow it. Like, let's say watermelon. I'm a watermelon farmer. I love growing watermelon, but I have to remember that watermelon are insect pollinated. So if I want to save two different types of watermelon seed, they have to be far enough apart or I have to hand pollinate them and then bag those flowers so they don't get cross pollinated. And so there's, you know, again, a, a process where I could just pick one seed then I could just grow this one watermelon. And I have enough, you know, it's the only one in my garden and I have enough uh, gap around hopefully the next watermelon farmer that I can focus on that seed. So I think that the hope would be that people eventually would be educated enough about how to do that. But what's more realistic, I think, is that we would be educating through a class of how to become a seed farmer. And then we would actually be investing in local seed farmers to do some of the production to offset um, external seed inputs. Um, so that's kind of where that takes me. But then I also think about the external seed inputs. Those are write-offs. You know, those all of those donations of seed are, are write-offs for those organizations. And so sometimes you can get seed that's just about to expire and you have, you know, still 85% germination rate, right? But legally speaking, just like certain food, right? They put a stamp of best buy date on there. Seeds are treated in the same way. And manufacturers or, you know, seed distributors are going to have to destroy those seeds and write them off. So instead of destroying them, it's better for them to donate. That's so brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, super important part of Seed Library is like having those relationships with seed companies and getting them to donate. Um, and so I, I feel like, again, all these challenges that we're talking about, as much as it's the ecological is the like thing social. that we're seeing, it's all social related for sure. Big time. I'm thinking of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. I mean, and all different kinds of organizations and 4-H club and it would be great to be having that be foundational in our schools, even school programs. It's yeah. there's such a possibility there. It's very yeah. exciting. Yeah, and it's beautiful because it seems like there's more interest now than ever before. And I think COVID I, woke people up in a big way to say, hey, uh, maybe we need to be accountable to this in a different way. Yep. Yep. Especially with just the shipping challenges, you know, right. I, I think that, and again, I, I feel really blessed to be in San Diego where I can have all that biodiversity and there's other places that we've built cities around that are, you know, they were railroad towns. They're not in the best locations, ecologically speaking, and okay. they're really limited in their natural resources, especially water, right. And soil, a good, healthy soil. So I think that that's what the challenge we're facing right now in this country is that you know, so much of our food's grown in California, and then the rest of it is, you know, very, very limited biodiversity, and from, you know, all those Midwestern regions, and so I, I definitely, that's one of my, my, my uh, concerns around food resiliency and sovereignty, is that some places are going to really struggle to get all of their needs met, and they're going to really be dependent upon external inputs and trades and resources and oftentimes it's it's just that much easier for them to go to those agrochemical companies and get those fertilizers than it is to like build that social relationship that you know might be across state lines i mean yeah it's complicated you know it's occurring to me that we're in a data age and using databases to support this kind of cross-pollination, so to speak, I think could be very, very powerful. And I think that there are a lot of innovators out there 
that are developing these kinds of applications that will, it's, it's just such a beautiful, virtuous use of technology. Yeah, I agree. I've, uh, for the longest time, had the dream of a, of a, a, an application where I could help with that uh, seed databasing, where like the information and specifics about a particular type of seed, its regionality, how it was grown. Um, and so actually uh, it was shared with me, I'm in a seed farming class right now that just to expand my knowledge and learn more about that whole business side of how to sell and produce seeds. And um, I'll, I'll have to give you the link for this resource, but it's one of these ones is basically where you can go in and you can you can browse by seed type and it actually gives you an option for like altitude and wow. other conditions. And so this is the first time I'd seen it. And uh, I, I've had that in my mind for a long time of like, there's definitely a way we could crowdsource that kind of data through a, an application that would allow us to say, hey, you and I are growing the same seeds. I'm growing them here. Here was my yield. Here's my soil type. Here's my conditions. And using, you know, USGS databases alongside climate databases, we can gather all of this and and aggregate it in such a way. And like you said, the the technology can be utilized in an effective manner to help us help inform us, right? And that's how I want to see technology utilized AI in that way is that's rather than it doing the planting for me, I want it to do the data crunching so I can input my my ideas and get a suggestion. And I think that that's, that's the hope would be to kind of have those maps and say, hey, here's the top 10 potatoes you should grow or the top 10 apples you should grow. And, you know, here's where you can source them from and things like that. So. Well, maybe we will be able to connect you to the resource to help build that. So Nathan, this has been such a delight. Can you please give us your website so that folks can go look at it and also how people might reach you? Yeah, totally. Um, I've really enjoyed being able to share with you and uh, I look forward to, to anyone reaching out to me uh, at Nathan at mongoltribe.org. Um, if you go on to uh, mongoltribe.org slash story map, you can see my uh, work about the Oak Woodlands. Um, and it's M-O-N-G-O-L-T-R-I-B-E.org. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook at the same. And, um, but yeah, feel free to, to shoot me a message on any of those um, platforms or send me an email and uh, always happy to, to connect and network and uh, collaborate. So feel free to reach out. Beautiful. So is there any question I should have asked that I didn't ask? Oh, man. Man, we could we could talk about questions like this all day. So uh, <laughs> let's see, man. I I would say that um, you know, for me, I the one thing I really like to share that I didn't get to share a lot about is my cultural background. Um, so my father's side is uh, I grew up in a Cantonese household, and um, it, my my cultural background after running my genetics is Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, Sri Lankan, Northern Southern Han, uh, Punjabi. Uh, Bengali and uh, uh, Northwestern European and Peruvian. Wow. So, yeah. So it's just, it's been really beautiful to like have those connections to food and culture. And so um, I'm really leaning into a lot of that as to how I've learned about myself and about, um, you know, what really inspires me. And so, yeah, so I'm always excited to see how others relate to food and their ancestry because after realizing and learning that, I was like, wow, I already eat all these foods and I already am attracted to all these kind of plants and things. So um, yeah, that's something that I, I'm really happy to share. What a great way to wrap it up, wrap up our conversation. Thank you for that. Um, it, it, because food is so tied to culture and we all have access, we have awareness of different plants as a result and different preparations. That's a, that's a really great insight. Wonderful way to close close our conversation. So uh, that's it for today. I'm Mira Rubin, um, and this is Sustainability Now. And I want to say thank you to all of our viewers and listeners uh, for carrying the torch, for staying staying hopeful and active, and. Um, also want to say thanks to my co-founder of Sustainability Now, Scott Billy, 
Uh, he also is our producer. So until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.